Greetings, everyone, all over this watered world of ours. Laszlo Montgomery here, back in Claremont, but not for long. I'm New Hampshire bound on Wednesday, and then off to the town of Charlotte, Vermont, and then back here on Friday. But before I go, I am offering up to everyone our first China History podcast since May 3rd, when we did the Qing Dynasty Part 7 and finished those guys off. Since that episode, we've had the review of the overviews and the Q&A episode, but those don't really count. We're back with the real deal today, and I'm choosing a topic today uh, that was not the one I originally intended to do. I was going to sort of pick up after Puyi abdicated and then look at the immediate aftermath of the Xinhai Rebellion, but I picked up a story on my Twitter feed about a bill introduced to Congress and sponsored by L.A.'s own, the Honorable Congresswoman from the 32nd District here in California, Judy Chu, known throughout the Chinese-speaking world as Zhao Meixin. She is, among other achievements, the former mayor of Monterey Park, a.k.a. Little Taipei. That city has sort of been the center of gravity for all Chinese of the San Gabriel Valley communities here. She's had a wonderful life in academia and in government public service. And Dr. Chu also has the honor of being the first Chinese American ever elected to the U.S. Congress. This was in 2009. Congresswoman Chu is calling for a resolution calling on Congress to formally acknowledge and express regret for the discriminative laws against Chinese Americans, particularly between 1882 to 1943. The resolution was introduced this past Thursday. Uh, it all began with local grassroots efforts from Chinese American communities. Uh, along with Dr. Chu, our Congresswoman Judy Biggert of Illinois' 13th District, that's the southwest suburbs of Chicago, and Colorado Representative Mike Kaufman, who serves the people south of Denver and the beautiful town of Castle Rock. They're joined by Senators Dianne Feinstein of my state here, California, and Scott Brown of Massachusetts. I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot about this in the weeks to come, so I thought this would be a great topic to look at today. The whole history of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and all the events that led up to it. This is not what you call one of the finest moments here in the USA, with the exception of a very chosen few, pretty much the lion's share of the 300 million or so citizens of the USA came from immigrant parents or grandparents or at least great-grandparents. I know I did. Essentially, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was the first major law to come out of our government that restricted immigration to the U.S. of a single ethnic group, namely the Chinese. The resolution introduced to Congress will essentially call for a kind of apology for all the stuff that went down in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that not only discriminated heavily against the Chinese, but sort of created a political atmosphere. It was okay to bash Chinese and take all kinds of measures to make their lives miserable or at the very least inconvenient here in the U.S. So let's wind the clock back all the way to January 1848. Our tale begins there in a town called Coloma, California, which was halfway between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe. At a place called Sutter's Mill, a man named James W. Marshall found gold in the American River that ran through the town. Marshall was helping Mr. Sutter to build a sawmill on his property, but once gold was discovered, the sawmill sort of got backburnered, and the California gold rush happened instead. Now, if you recall from our Qing Dynasty podcast, the 1840s, 50s, and 60s was a perfectly awful time in China. You had the Opium War and the Treaty of Nanjing in 1842 and the Taiping Rebellion, among a myriad of other social disturbances that had a lot of Chinese running for the exits. Those Chinese caught up in all the history happening around them that had the wherewithal and the guts bolted from the safety and comfort of their homes and families and emigrated to parts all over the world, including Southeast Asia, Europe, and the United States. 
The first major wave of Chinese immigrants who came to the U.S. were there for one thing only. They were a source of lower-cost labor to work the gold mines and later to build the railroads. They worked for as much as 40% less than what the mining companies had to pay the white workers. So the same old song you hear today with immigrants from south of our border depressing wages and stealing jobs from self-respecting Americans was also being sung back in the 19th century, too. But back in the 1850s and 1860s, the, the rush was on and times were good, so although racism and unfair treatment against Chinese was present, it hadn't yet gotten out of hand. The first 500 Chinese immigrants made their way over about 1850 to work the mines. Mind you, besides these 500 Chinese, there were also 57,287 other immigrant miners who came from elsewhere, but not from China. However, the Chinese miners were especially wanted because they were willing to work harder, keep their mouths shut, and were willing to put up with lousier working conditions than the next guy. A tax of $20 per month was put on these laborers. It was meant to affect all foreigners, but was targeted specifically at Chinese miners. This was one of the first of many injustices they had to face just trying to make it here. In 1852, there were 11,794 Chinese immigrants living in California, of which seven were women. This total number of immigrants quickly shot up to 20,000, mostly working in the gold mines in Northern California. In 1854, though, things started to get a little dicey for the Chinese, and it was a bad sign when California Supreme Court Justice uh, Hugh Murray delivered his opinion in the People of the State of California versus George W. Hall. Good old People versus Hall. George Hall was a white man who beat up and killed a Chinese miner named Ling Sing. Three Chinese witnesses had testified to the killing of Ling by Hall, but the judge's ruling effectively said Chinese immigrants had no right to testify against a white man. Uh, African Americans and Indians had already suffered this fate, and all the judge did was add Chinese to this group. So after the People versus Hall, it effectively gave a kind of a seal of approval to violence against Chinese by Caucasian Americans. Things really came to a head in 1877 when you had the anti-Chinese riots in San Francisco following the Great Railroad Strike, but we'll get to that in a minute. In 1868, you had the Burlingame Seward Treaty between the U.S. and China. It amended the hated Treaty of Tianjin of 1858, which we discussed in the Qing Dynasty Part 5 episode. With this Burlingame Treaty, good relations between the U.S. and China were formally established, and China got most favored nation status. The treaty was ratified in Beijing the next year in 1869. Now, if you recall, this was during the time of the Tongzhi Emperor, who was the Empress Dowager Cixi's son and who she ruled through. He was the Emperor of the Tongzhi Restoration, the Tongzhi Zhongxing, that was stopped in its tracks by the Emperor's mother. Uh, the Burlingame Treaty, as it became known, among other things, gave a boost to Chinese immigration into the USA and offered immigrants a pathway to naturalization. The Chinese, who had made their way to America and who were building a future in Jiujinshan, as San Francisco was called, Old Gold Hills, they needed to build a support system to take care of their particular needs, and thus the Six Tongs were formed to give representation to the Chinese and organize their interests. A Tong, or a Tang, as it's known in Mandarin, means a meeting hall. These Tongs were linked to the pro-Guomindang groups in China, known as the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, or Zhongguo Huiguan. Now, some of these Tongs, as uh, we know, degraded into criminal activity and became nothing more than gangs, but many at the time provided essential services to Chinese immigrants. And they were created out of necessity. Chinese had, they had nowhere to go, and they needed the support of those who had come before them and knew all the necessary survival skills and... Uh, uh, in the United States. 1862 was a banner year when the Pacific Railroad Bill was passed, which green-lighted a transcontinental railroad for the U.S. The next year, in 1863, the Central Pacific Railroad broke ground. White workers threatening a strike in 1865 prompted railroad bosses to 
bring in the first 50 Chinese laborers. And then in two short years, by 1867, 90% of the workers building the railroads in the U.S. were Chinese. Things were starting to look dismal for the Chinese. You hit the Working Men's Party, founded in San Francisco in 1867, with their slogan, The Chinese Must Go. The party was led by an Irishman named Dennis Kearney. He wasn't the first and certainly not the last American politician to seize on racism as a way to stir up the voters and get them to flock to his side. He organized all these anti-Chinese rallies in San Francisco outside Old City Hall, down the street from Chinatown. Kearney Street in San Francisco Chinatown is not named for him, by the way. That was a different Kearney. So anyway, the Working Man's Party initiated and secretly sponsored all kinds of violence against the Chinese and used all their tricks to stir up anti-Chinese sentiment. With so many Chinese now entering the country as a result of the Burlingame Treaty, the anti-Chinese immigration forces started to organize more and become more vociferous in their denouncements of this policy. Even California's third governor, John Bigler, made fiery anti-Chinese speeches and urged Californians to, quote, check this tide of Asiatic immigration. Governor John Bigler was no less a racist than any other governor you might find in the Deep South during the Jim Crow days. He sponsored all kinds of legislation that targeted the Chinese and Anything that took from them or inhibited their success in achieving the American dream was okay with Governor Bigler. So the 1870s roll around and the gold rush is over. And when the panic of 1873 hits, the Chinese in the United States really have to band together to fend off what was coming. The panic of 1873, like the times we are in right now, or perhaps emerging out of right now, was a worldwide depression that affected Europe and the U.S. mostly. Following Germany's abandonment of the silver standard in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War, a worldwide slump in the price of silver ensued. This started in Europe and it spread to the U.S. banks and then banks started failing in all the major financial centers in the U.S. And in the, in the railroad business, there was 364 railroads and then the U.S. and 89 of them went bankrupt. Businesses failed and Massive unemployment, yet 14% unemployment, uh, sounds terribly familiar, doesn't it? Well, when times get tough, you have to find somebody to blame. With such high unemployment, the natural targets were, of course, immigrants. Back then, as they do today, immigrants were always willing to work a little harder for less money and the chance that they could gain a foothold and create a foundation for their children and their grandchildren. And if conditions were deplorable, well... Immigrants usually kept their mouths shut and just sort of put up with it. And capitalism, being what it is, big businesses depended on immigrants to provide lower-cost labor that led to greater profits and company performance. The white workers had to either work for less or stay unemployed. They vented their spleen against the Chinese, and any candidate for political office back then merely had to adopt an anti-Chinese platform and they'd get votes and popularity. The fact that Chinese, like many other immigrant groups, tended to stick together and you know, were slow to adopt American customs, it just made things worse and was a point that infuriated Americans that already had these racist tendencies. And word had traveled about all the atrocities that were going on during the Taiping Rebellion and stories of murdered Christian missionaries and hardships Westerners faced in China were all popularized in the U.S. press, so this didn't help the Chinese in the U.S. court of public opinion. Violence against Chinese wasn't just happening in San Francisco's Chinatown. On October 24th, you had the Chinese Massacre of 1871. 500 whites rioted and attacked Chinese in L.A.'s Chinatown. When it was all over, there were 15 Chinese found hanging from various spots around Chinatown. Every building and place of business had been ransacked. The L.A. coroner pronounced 18 dead, but the true number of Chinese killed that night, and the massacre was as high as 84. You can visit the massacre site today. There's a Chinese American museum there, right on Los Angeles Street, which back in 1871 was known as the dreaded Calle de los Negros. Fifteen years later, in Rock Springs, Wyoming, you had the Rock Springs Massacre, which was 
all about racist tension that grew about as a result of animosity at Chinese laborers who gladly took $32.50 a month pay, which undercut the white workers who had demanded $52 a month. So mostly Swedish and English workers, they led the rioting against the Chinese, and in the end, 28 Chinese were killed and 15 injured. And of course, Chinese homes and businesses were burned to the ground. So California, Wyoming, also in the Washington Territory in the Northwest, Chinese faced all this hostility and violence. This really was a a golden age, if you want to call it that, of anti-Chinese racism in the United States. Go on the Google and search for images related to Chinese exclusion acts, and you'll see the most vile, racist, the most outrageous political cartoons and racist propaganda. You can't believe anyone would openly say such things, but not only was it pervasive, it was downright popular. You see, the U.S. economy didn't, well, it didn't recover so quickly from the Civil War. And like I said, once the real hard times hit in the 1870s, the easiest thing to do was vent one's anger against the easiest ones to lash out against. And politicians then, as they do today, they tap into that vein of hatred, and it's a powerful force that unfortunately is extremely useful in a, in a Machiavellian kind of way. And what can I say? Tapping into fear, loathing, and hatred was as much a vote-getter back then as it is today. I included a few of these political cartoons on my website at ChinaHistoryPodcast.com. If you're interested, go search for them on the web. They're not hard to find. This depression that did so much to fuel the anti-Chinese and anti-immigrant hatred lasted till about 1879. But it was in 1877 that you had the Great Railroad Strike. Mind you, in 1870, you had about 50,000 Chinese in California and 75,000 by 1879. This was 9% of California's total population. Since the Chinese laborers, who were called coolies, from the Chinese word kuli, or bitter labor, they were symbols of scorn and infuriated California's hard up and unemployed. 1876 to 1878 were some rough times in California. You saw downright destitute people living in streets and surviving on whatever charity there was. Mobs would get stirred up and they'd start rioting and attacking Chinese businesses. In July 1877, you had three bloody nights of anti-Chinese riots in San Francisco. It was a terrible time for Chinese and a terrible moment in the annals of U.S. history. So the tone was set for what became known as the Chinese Exclusion Act. In 1879, legislation was passed calling for a curb on Chinese immigration, but the 19th president, Rutherford B. Hayes, vetoed this on the grounds that it violated the Burlingame Treaty. However, the next year in 1880, after massive political beatings Hayes took at the hands of Democrats, the Chinese Exclusion Treaty was signed, which was followed in 1882 by the infamous Chinese Exclusion Act. The Treaty of 1880 curbed the number of Chinese immigrants allowed into the U.S., as well as how many could become naturalized citizens. The act, which followed in 1882, slammed the doors shut and prevented any immigration at all of Chinese immigrants to the U.S. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was signed by Chester Allen Arthur, who became the 21st president after the assassination of James Abram Garfield in Washington, D.C. in 1881, a 10-year moratorium was put into effect on any Chinese immigration. Any resident aliens applying for citizenship had two chances of succeeding, little and none. So now, for the first time in U.S. history, a law is passed that prohibits immigration targeting a specific race of people. And not only did it halt Chinese immigration, It also presented huge hardships to Chinese already here and made it next to impossible to leave the U.S. and get back in without jumping through endless hoops. The labor unions were all big supporters of the exclusion acts, as you might imagine they would. So, ten years goes by, and now it's 1892, and all they do is say, ten more years. You have the the Gary Act, sponsored by California Congressman Thomas J. Gary. It extended the Chinese Exclusion Act for another 10 years with an additional twist. 
Those Chinese immigrants who were legal had to register and carry papers with them at all times that amounted to a passport that they had to use in their own country. If you were stopped by the law and someone demanded, show me your papers, if you didn't have them, you'd get deported. So this goes on for another 10 years, and now we're in the 20th century. The Boxer Rebellion had just happened, and all the bad press it gave China. So it's now 1902, and rather than repeal the Chinese Exclusion Act or give it another 10 years, the U.S. government, in its infinite wisdom, says, let's make this permanent. One thing that came about that was quite interesting was this. By law, if you were a legal Chinese citizen of the U.S., you got to apply for two children to come to the U.S. from China. Well, a kind of scam started whereby legal Chinese citizens of the U.S. could sell their rights, so to speak, for the immigration of their two children in China. So let's say Mr. Wong is legal and he has this right, but he hasn't used it yet. Now, Mr. Lum... He has two kids, but he's trying like crazy to get here, but he's not legal and doesn't have this right. But he does have some kind of special relationship with Mr. Wong, and they could work out a deal whereby Mr. Wong will arrange for the immigration of Mr. Lum's two children, or whoever they were, using his legal rights. Then Mr. Lum's kids arrive, but they're forced to go through life as the children of Mr. Wong, lest the authorities find out that these were mere paper sons and would be promptly deported. All city records were destroyed in the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906, so it was very easy for Mr. Wong and Mr. Lam to take advantage of the disruptions in the system. So a whole generation of these paper sons, as they all came to be known, grew up in the Chinatowns of California. And the stories about what these guys endured using every method at their disposal trained by wise immigrants who had succeeded and passed on their wisdom about how to dupe the immigration authorities when the time came. Only in the 1950s were these paper sons granted amnesty and allowed to reveal their true identities. And Angel Island, you may have heard of that place before, it was referred to as the Ellis Island of the West. From 1910 to 1940, when a fire closed the place down, uh, it served as an immigration station where approximately a million Asian immigrants were processed. This might be a whole topic for a future podcast. The stories are quite incredible, as they were in Ellis Island, of the hardships, tragedies, and injustices that immigrants faced on Angel Island. Well, this all went on until 1943, the year the U.S. and China became allies against the Japanese in World War II. Finally, in 1943, 61 years after Chester Arthur signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law, a bill sponsored by Warren G. Magnuson of Washington State is passed, it's known as the Magnuson Act, and repealed the Chinese Exclusion Act. Chinese immigration now resumed for the first time since 1882. Mind you, the number was limited to only 105 a year, and there were still restrictions on Chinese owning property and businesses, but all this would disappear later. Many Chinese now had the road to naturalization open to them, and then things began to cool down after so many decades of racial tension and hatred. The times were changing, I mean, the world was changing, the post War economic boom that happened after World War II was about to take off in America, and hey, when times are good, no one's concerned about finding anyone to blame. So the story ends in 1965 with the passing of the Immigration and Nationality Act. This act was heavily sponsored by the late Senator Ted Kennedy, whose Senate seat is now occupied by uh, Senator Scott Brown, who, as I mentioned, is a co-sponsor of this resolution I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast also known as the Heart Seller Act, what it did was to abolish what was known as the National Origins Quotas that had been put in place in the 1920s that said you got so many from this country allowed in and X amount from this one and whatever from that one. It was unfair and very arbitrary. With the Heart Seller Act, which President Johnson signed into law October 3rd, 1965, a more fair system was put in place which used a a preference system that took into consideration family relationships, skills, and whatnot. LBJ signed this into law at the Statue of Liberty. And so it is that now we have this resolution now up for a vote. It 
calls for the U.S. government to issue an apology or expression of regret for all that happened to the Chinese in America during this long period of government-supported racism. Some may say, you know, it's so long ago, why do we have to dredge all this past injustice up and cause all these hard feelings? And, and some on the right might say, why do we have to apologize? And it's beneath the U.S. Well, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. There's going to be a vote soon. And after reading about this, I thought, hey, this might be a good idea to look at this period of history and get informed about all that went on and what this was all about so that we could better understand this issue that's before us today. You know, the generation of Chinese Americans who were directly affected by these racist immigration laws are of the age where they are now slowly starting to pass from this earth. So perhaps it wouldn't be a bad thing to acknowledge this dark chapter from American history while they're still here so that they may get some closure to this. And so, anyways, that was the whole deal with the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act. We'll be watching the outcome of the vote on this uh, upcoming resolution. So I think we'll call it a day right here. This is Laszlo Montgomery once again bidding everyone around the world and around the U.S. a fond and friendly farewell from, yes, lovely Claremont, California, the city of trees and Ph.D.s. We have more Ph.D.s per square inch than any other place in the U.S. of A. or something like that. Thanks for listening, everyone. The new website is coming. Keep hanging in there. Join us next week, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.